Our objective in this demo is really, really simple, and it's to build a virtual private network between two sites of, a, of the same company. So here we have R2, which is the edge router for Acme Incorporated. Maybe this is the Las Vegas office. And then we have R4, which is the edge router for Acme Inc. in Des Moines, Iowa. And we're using private address space. So if we wanted to get to the internet, how would we do that? Well, we've used network address translation, and I have lots of other great YouTube videos on network address translation. But here, I'd like to focus on connectivity between this portion of our network in Las Vegas and this portion of our network out here in Des Moines, Iowa. We're going to do that by something called IPsec. It's really pretty straightforward. Check this out. We train R2. We just give them some, we whisper in its ear and say, hey, dear Mr. R2, anytime you see packets, if they are sourced, from the 10 network and they're destined for the 192.168.1 network, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that packet and instead of just trying to forward it to your default gateway, I want you to take the packet, encrypt it, make it all top secret, and then encapsulate it inside of another packet and send it over to R4. So the internet, all they're gonna see is a packet that is sourced from 230.1.2 R2's global address, and destined to 56.2.11.2. They never saw the private IP address ranges on the internet because it's all encapsulated inside of IPsec packets. R4, when he gets a packet, he's going to decrypt it, and then he'll forward it on to the final destination. That's what the game is all about with IPsec. So there's actually two tunnels that are going to be built to do this game of IPsec. One is called the Ike Phase 1 Tunnel between R4 and R2. And you can kind of think of it like the cone of silence from the good old days with Get Smart, where the chief and Agent 99, or Agent 86, were gonna be talking to each other. And they had a personal private party line. That's what the Ike Phase 1 Tunnel is all about. If R2 and R4 need to talk to each other, they're gonna use that private party line, the Ike Phase 1 Tunnel. They're also going to use that Ike Phase 1 tunnel to build the IPsec tunnel itself. That's the tunnel that the user from PC1's packets are going to be used to encrypt upon as they're being sent between R2 and R4. So there are uh, several moving parts, but primarily we're building an Ike Phase 1 tunnel so that R2 and R4 can negotiate secret keys and talk to each other. And then we're also building an IPsec tunnel, which R2 and R4 will use on behalf of packets they need to encrypt send over, and then decrypt and forward on their way. To make this even more interesting, what I'd like to do is just verify that PC1 can't get to the 192.168.1 network at the moment. We'll just do a ping of 192.168.1.4. And all that's going to do for us is PC's PC1 is sending it to his default gateway. R1 is routing it to R2. R2 is trying to use the default gateway of the service provider, who is then killing it. So we've captured all that, and we'll take a look at the protocol analysis as well, but that those unreachable messages are the service provider telling us that, yep, I killed the packet. That service provider is at 23.0.1.3, by the way. So let's build our IPsec tunnel. The very first thing we're going to do is go to R2, and on R2, we need to specify the policy for the Ike Phase 1 tunnel. So we'll go over to R2, and the way we do that is really simple. In configuration mode, we're going to say, Crypto ISACAMP policy one, and we're going to say we're going to use authentication of pre shared keys. There's two primary methods for making two devices prove who they are to each other. One is to use RSA signatures, which is like a digital driver's license, and the second is to use a pre shared key that they both have that they can both use to help verify that the other, the party on the other side is who they say they are. So we're going to do that on R2 and R4. So that's what we're doing right here. All the other defaults for Ike phase one, we are going to accept. And there are several others, including the hashing type and including the Diffie-Hellman group and a few others. But we're going to take all the defaults except for the authentication method. We're going to specify we're going to use pre-shared keys. What's the next thing we'd want to do? Well, the next thing we'd want to do is say, if we are using pre-shared keys, I need to specify what that pre-shared key is with R4. So crypto ISACAMP key Cisco is my key. That's not a very good key for production, but for testing it'll work. And I'm saying I'm going to use this key with a peer at 56.2.11.2. And another thing we had to really do is make sure that R2 has reachability to that other IP address. So let's do a real quick ping. 
because I don't want to set ourselves up and have us not successfully build a tunnel because we don't have reachability to that other global address, 56.2.11.2. So we're just pinging this IP address right here. Okay, that's good news. So we've set up our egg phase one policy to use pre-shared keys. We've specified that we want to use the key of Cisco with the peer at 56.2.11.2. What's next? Well, the next thing we need to do is we need to identify interesting traffic. One of the fun things in ICND that I get to talk about with students is the purpose of an access list. We can use an access list for so many different things. We can use an access list for filtering. We can apply it inbound or outbound on an interface. We can use it for NAT to identify who may be translated. And we can also use it to identify what traffic should be sent in the VPN tunnel. So in this case, we're going to create an access list of 100. And I'm going to identify any traffic source from the 10 network that's also destined for the 192.168.1 subnet, or actually I should say network. And that's it. So I'm not going to apply this access list to an interface. I'm going to use this as part of my VPN cryptography policy to tell it what traffic to encrypt and what traffic not to encrypt. The next thing I'm going to do is specify exactly what type of IPsec policy to use for the IPsec tunnel. And we do that by creating what's called a transform set. And the syntax is crypto IPsec transform set. I'm going to call it my set. And then I'm going to specify we're going to use uh, SHA for hashing, and we're going to use AES for encryption. And that's it. So check this out. We created an access list that says what traffic will be, or what traffic should be identified for cryptography. We created a transform set, but check this out. We have not applied any of this yet. It's just in the global config. It's sitting there, maybe drinking some you know, soft drink, having a good time. We haven't put it to use yet. Here's how we bind it all together we are going to create something called a crypto map. A crypto map simply is the, the master list that says, I want to include all these ingredients. So let me walk you through exactly how to do that. Crypto map, I'm gonna call it my map, sequence number one, I wanna use isocamp. I'm gonna say, I want the transform set to be my set. I want the peer to be R4's address, and I wanna match on address list, access list 100. All this is saying is that if, traffic matches access list 100, which is traffic from the 10 network to the 192.168, then I want to set my peer to be good old R4, his global IP address. And by the way, go ahead and use the transform set, my set, as far as what you're willing to negotiate for the IPsec tunnel. So we're going to negotiate the AES encryption and SHA hashing or HMAC for that IPsec tunnel. Now, the last thing to do is actually turn on the policy. We've got all the ingredients here, but we haven't actually turned it on. We need to tell R2 to apply this crypto map that we just created right here called my map, apply it to FA00. And we don't have to specify a direction. It's just going to look for any traffic that's trying to go out that interface, and it's going to apply the crypto map for it. So we go to interface FA00 and say crypto map and the name of the crypto map. And then we should get a little console message. There it is saying that the ISACAMP is now turned on. That's the Internet Security Association Key Management Protocol. Not, not too important to memorize what that means, just related to IPsec. So now R2 is willing. If packets come from the 10 network going to the 192.168 network, it's going to try to build an IPsec tunnel with R4, who's not configured yet, but will be in a moment. And once that builds that tunnel, it'll then go ahead and start encrypting traffic and sending them over the internet. So let's just do a quick verification. Show crypto map. And that shows you the entire story from the IPsec, IP specs, IPsec perspective. Easy for me to say. There's our peer or who it will be. There's the access list. And we are using the transform set called my set. The crypto map called my map is applied to FA00 right here. So now we go to R4 and do virtually the exact same config. What's the biggest difference here? Well, on R4, as we go out there, the biggest difference is, is that our peer is going to be R2's IP address. And the interesting traffic is going to be traffic from 192.168 going to the 10 network. So it's just simply going to be flipped. From R4's perspective, we're going to identify the traffic outbound that needs to be encrypted. So we create access list 100. 
to identify any traffic from 192.168.1.anything going to 10 anything. We then create our transform set, and the transform set should match what R2 is willing to do, because if they don't agree, they won't be too happy. We'll create a crypto map on R4. We can name it whatever we like. But the ingredients are we want to specify the transform set to use, who our peer is going to be, and also the ACL that we want to match on. You'll also notice that earlier we created the actual key for the peer, and the key matches on both sides. So now that this is on and enabled, let's see if it's going to work. Now I have a, the trace still running on this segment right here. I'm doing a wire capture of all the traffic. Let's go back to our PC. And on our PC that a moment ago couldn't do a ping, let's go ahead and do the ping. Now, pretty exciting. Normally we'd lose a, a period or time out of one packet due to an ARP resolution, and that could have been the case, but it's also likely it took just a moment for R2 and R4 to negotiate the IAC phase one tunnel, to negotiate the IPsec tunnel, to encapsulate the packets and send them over. If we do the ping again, it should work like a champ. So now that we've done that, how do we verify this? Here's some commands we can use to verify. We'll go over to R2. We already did the show crypto map, which is great. We can take a look at the show crypto IPsec SA which is an acronym for Security Association, and it will show us, here's the command right here, it'll show us how many packets have been encrypted and decrypted. So the first one didn't make it. The first IP uh, ping packet from PC1 out to R4's network didn't make it, and that was probably due to, it could have been a local ARP, very well could have been, but it's also very likely due to IPsec being set up. So we have, here's our interesting traffic, traffic from the 10 network going to the 192.168.1 network. These zeros represent the fact that uh, all IP protocols, I, IP anything, we aren't looking for just ICMP or just TCP. All traffic is going to be encrypted if it matches that. And there's our remote, our, here's our local endpoint and our destination endpoint for that VPN tunnel. And we had nine packets. So if we do one more ping, let's just round it out. Let's do a repeat of one. There's one more ping from this PC or device acting as that PC. We'll go back to R2 and do a show crypto IPsec SA. And you notice it increased to 10. So it's working and we have our connectivity. Let's take a moment and take a look at the wire capture for all the activity that just occurred. Well, let's take a look at the capture of everything that just occurred. We first tried a ping from PC1 which has the source IP address on the 10 network going to the 192 network, and it didn't make it. It was killed by 230.1.3, that's the IP address of our service provider, who sent an ICMP unreachable message back to the initiator of that packet, which is PC1 saying, sorry, I killed that packet. If we looked at the details of that packet, it would also include information describing the packet that was killed. So it's an ICMP message that tells us that a packet was killed. It also happened to be an ICMP packet that was killed in the process. So that failed. We got three messages back from our, the service provider. Fantastic. The next thing we did, we verified whether or not R2 from its global address could ping R4 to its global address, and it was successful. So we have four, uh, five successful pings and responses that are right here. Then we go down to this guy right here. Now, we configured Ike Phase 1 and Ike Phase 2, IPsec, on R2 and R4. The Ike Phase 1 refers to the crypto ISACAMP policy, where we said use pre-shared keys, and we specified it. We took everything else as the defaults. So when the packet from PC1 was going through the, outs the E00, FA00 interface of R2, let me show you that real quick. So as the packet from PC1 went out this interface, the crypto map was there, and R2 said, whoa, this packet is from, let's do a quick show, show crypto map. It said this traffic is from the 10 network. It's going to the 192.168.1 subnetwork that matches. I better encrypt this traffic. The problem was there was no tunnel built already between R2 and R4. So R2 started going into what's called main mode. Main mode is one of the methods that can be used in IPsec to negotiate the Ike phase one tunnel with a remote peer. So these six packets involve quite a bit of detail, including negotiating 
what Ike Phase 1 policies they're both acceptable to, running something called Diffie-Hellman to generate shared secret king material, and also to authenticate with each other. So that's what these six packets are. The next thing they did, R2 and R4, said, okay, we've got an Ike Phase 1 tunnel, it's great, but we need an Ike Phase 2 tunnel, or an IPsec tunnel, to encapsulate the packet from PC1. So how do we do that? They then go into something called Quick Mode. And these three packets, Quick Mode is negotiating the transform set that they're going to use for the actual IPsec tunnel and negotiate it and set it up. Then once it's set up, then they start encrypting the traffic. So the traffic was really this. The traffic was a ping packet from PC1 sourced from 10.1.0.25 destined to 192.168.1.4. When R2 got it, it encrypted it, wrapped it up into an ESP packet, which is protocol 50. We'll take a look at that in a moment and shipped it over the internet from its IP address to the global IP address of R4. R4 decrypted that packet and then forwarded it on to whoever was at dot four on that local network. So PC1 and the PC on this subnet have no clue that IPsec even happened as it went over the internet. They're just grateful that the packet made it all the way through. So let's take a look at IPsec here for a moment. IPsec, the protocol for it, let's take a look. Ethernet hands it up to IP. And IP is going to hand it up, in this case, up to protocol. Let me bring my screen up a little bit here. Up to protocol. <laughs> Look at that. Protocol 32. That's in hexadecimal. So three 16s plus two more is 50. So in decimal, it would be a layer 4 protocol called ESP, the Encapsulating Security Payload. And it is protocol 50 in decimal. So... Please excuse my hexadecimal interpretation on this Wireshark analyzer. And then it also shows us the payload. So once IP hands it up to ESP, the layer 4 protocol, we have no idea what's literally inside of it because the contents, however big it is, is going to be all encrypted. So somebody eavesdropping on the internet, they wouldn't know what the real source IP address was, what the destination IP address was, and they wouldn't know the, pay the contents. They wouldn't know if it's a telnet session or an SSH session or an HTTP session or a ping request or anything else because the contents of the payload between the edge of R2 and R4 is completely encrypted. And only R2 and R4 can encrypt and decrypt that data. So that's how it operates. And we should have, if we look at this, we should have 10 of these guys. We should have 10 requests and 10 responses. So let me uh, bring this all the way down. Let's count them real quick to make sure we got all the packets. Didn't miss a single one. Okay, so this is the bottom of the trace. So I've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Perfect, because we sent 10 requests and we got 10 responses. Nine initially from the first ping and the second ping, and then we did one more to round it out to a 10. So that's an overview of how IPsec can be used to build a site-to-site -site tunnel between Site A, this Las Vegas site of Acme Incorporated, and Site B using the internet as the backbone, if you will, or the carrier for our transmissions. I appreciate you participating and watching. Have a great, great rest of the day.